I'm talking about being a Christian today, being a biblical. You know, we coined that phrase a couple weeks ago, uh, a brand new noun, because the word Christian seems to be watered down. Well, you're a born again Christian, you're a charismatic Christian. No, 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 no. Either a Christian or you're a Christian, right? So let's, let's, not, let's not divide us and let's not water this thing down. And so we came up with this term biblical, which is quite an eyebrow raiser when you tell that to someone. It gives you a great opportunity to have a chat. But I, I wanna talk about uh, being a biblical, not a biblical as in like a, a not agnostic or an a theist, not an a biblical, but a Biblical, okay, you got what I'm saying? All right, so we, we're, we're currently known as Christians. Uh, there's two references of that in, in the Bible in uh, Acts 11.25. Then Barnabas uh, went to Troas to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians there in the town of Antioch doesn't necessarily mean that's when it all started, that they were called Christians in Acts 11, but later in retrospect, we know now that's where the phrase came from, from the church at Antioch. Later in Acts, verse 20, uh, chapter 26, um, Paul is talking to Festus under uh, um, Roman rule. He says, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. He's defending himself, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable, and the king is familiar with all these things I've been talking about freely to him, and I'm, I'm convinced that no one of this, uh, not, no, none of this has escaped your notice, O great king, because it was not done over there in a corner. It was right here so everybody could see. Now, then King Agrippa said, uh, uh, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Oh, I know you do. And then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian. There's that word again. But long before we were known as Christians, we were known as something else. We were called people of the way. People of the way. Uh, for the first, well, 50, maybe 100 years after the resurrection, even John the Baptist, remember? Luke chapter one, verse 76. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, prophesying of him, for you will go before the Lord and prepare the way. And then again, you have the same verse in uh, Luke 3, 4. And then Mark chapter 1, verse 3. He reminds us that John the Baptist was a voice of one calling in the desert. And what did he say? Prepare the way for the Lord. Now in Jesus' life, Luke chapter 20, we got a few scriptures to look at here. And then, then we'll get down to business, so hang on. So the spies questioned him. This is at the crucifixion or prior his betrayal. Teacher, we know that you speak and, and teach what is right, and you do not show partiality, but you teach the way of God in accordance to the truth. And then in Mark 12, 14, John 14, one through four, there's a whole many of them. Acts chapter one, I told you I had an hour and a half sermon here, so we're just gonna... We're just gonna get the fighter jet and fly across the top of the mountains here. But stop at Acts 9, verse number one. Meanwhile, Saul, this is, at the, this is at, after the stoning of Stephen. Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciple. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters so he could go to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners. No, he just wanted to kill them. Acts 16, Jesus is telling you the way. Acts 18, 24. Meanwhile, the Jews, the Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. Uh, he was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scripture, and he had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke great fervor and taught about Jesus uh, accurately. Though he knew only the baptisms of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, and when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way. Acts 19, Paul entered the synagogue, spoke boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. We were constantly in the way back in the day as Christians. Acts 19, 23, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. 
Acts 24, however, I admit that I worship God and of our fathers and as a follower of the way, which they called a sect and so on and so on and so forth. Finally, Acts 24, 22, then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. Long before we were Christians, we were called people of the way. Why? Well, Jesus said of himself in John 14, 6, what? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So as biblicals, which is what we are, I hope, our roots, our heritage, our ancestors, our forefathers, our foremothers, they were all biblicals. They were people of the way for the first couple hundred years of Christianity. Now, everybody put their high school history thinking cap on for a second because it's really important what happens here. One of the best things that could ever happen to Christianity happened. And at the same time, it was one of the worst things that could ever happen to Christianity happened. And that is the Roman Empire. We all know where Rome is. It's in Italy, over there by the boot, right? Then you have Greece, then you have Turkey, then you have kind of the Holy Land all across there. What happened was there was a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine, and there were some skirmishes over who was really going to run the whole shebang. There's actually four of them that got themselves all worked up in a tizzy. Constantine was the man. Emperor Constantine said, enough of all this. We're going to go to war. The night before he went to war, he had a dream, a vision, and he looked up in heaven, and he, when he, what he saw up in heaven was the cross of Christ, and he saw two Greek letters. He saw the letter chi, and he saw the letter rho, and they were intersected like that. Have you ever seen that sign before? The chi is the X, and the P is the rho. Those are the two Greek letters, the first two Greek letters of the word Christos, which is the Greek word for, guess, Christ. Those are the first two letters of Christ's name. So whenever you see the chi and the rho in this position, it's talking to you about the name of Christ, Christos in Greek. So he had this vision in the sky, came down. He had that as his army banner. That became the army banner for, for Rome because he's a Christian now. And you may, know, may have heard of his mother, Helena, which is another whole great story, but we don't have time to unpack her, her, her Christian heritage. But he becomes a Christian. He gives his life to Christ. Cairo becomes a symbol of the, of the army. He saw this vision of the cross, and he's going to conquer in the name of Jesus from here on. Goes out the next day, basically, and wins the war. And now he is the emperor. Great thing, right? Awesome. He's a Christian now. What did he do? He decriminalized Christianity's worship because before that, it was illegal. We're talking the year 312, about 312. Did I tell you 312? I meant to tell you three. Is that one of your answers? Yeah. Oh, 312. That's when he converted. Sorry about that. He converted in, in uh, 312. That's an important date to remember. He decriminalized Christian worship. He gave tax-exempt status to the church. We're not going to tax these guys anymore. He constructed Constantinople. Constantinople Istanbul, not Constantinople. Yes, it's Istanbul, not Constantinople. You don't know Constant. You don't know Constantinople. You call it Istanbul. But before it was Istanbul, it was Constantinople. Does it sound familiar? As in Constantine. He says, "Okay, here's what we got going on. We need a Nova, new Roma, Rome. We need a new Nova Roma because the Rome that I'm currently in is littered with gods." This city is not Christian. Let's go get a new capital for Rome, a Nova Roma, and we're gonna make it over there. And we're gonna call it Constantinople, which is on like the little piece of land that connects uh, Turkey uh, towards Greece. I don't think it's Bulgaria today, somewhere. I'm not real, for, real solid on that, but it's, 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 the, it's that little piece of land on the northeast corner of Turkey, and that's where Constantinople is. That's where he decided he was going to build a... I mean, when you're the emperor, you can pretty much do anything you want, right? Let's have a Nova Roma. Let's get a new Rome. It's going to be here, and we're not going to put any of those foreign gods in there. There's going to be a Christian town. I mean, I'm the emperor. I can do whatever I want. So he did that. 
There were state lands then that were given to the church. He outlawed, he outlawed crucifixion. He declared, the, he declared that uh, the Christian day of the week is Sunday. I mean, a lot of big stuff he did. He ended the gladiators. No more are we throwing Christians to the wolves or into the lions. They're stopping all that. The pagan temples began to slowly uh, go away. And then in 325, oh, not too much longer after he got saved, he said, you know what? Now imagine this. You're the Roman emperor. You're Constantine. What do you do as the Roman emperor? You fix things. You break things and fix things. Fix things. That's what you do. You can do whatever you want. You can build a city if you want to build a city. I mean, you see something wrong, you just decree it to be right, right? So now he's been a Christian for about 10 years, and he looks at Christianity and he goes, oh, you guys are, oh, man, you're a mess. You are so unorganized. You're just kind of wormed your way into everything. You don't seem to have any kind of hierarchy. There's not a, you, let me organize you all. And by the way, right now, I understand there's some things going on in Christendom where uh, there is a heresy slipping in that Jesus isn't equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is subservient to the Father. It's an ancient heresy of the second century, which was r running rampant during uh, Emperor uh, Constantine coming to Christianity. He says, well, this is a great opportunity. We can nip that thing in the bud. Let's get all, get all you important people, all you religious leaders, come here to Nicaea and get your stuff together. He is the one who called the council of Nicaea. Constantine did, because he's a Christian now. And he says, you all need to get your stuff together because the Apostles' Creed was perfect for the first 300 years. We studied that a couple weeks ago, right? But now the Nicene Creed comes along and we need this because specifically it addresses the Trinity in the Creed. It talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and where they came from and what their powers and authorities are. Constantine did that. Wow, what a dude. That was awesome. But what he did when he, when he gathered the, the nobility of Christendom, and I use that phrase lightly, what he did when he gathered these important religious leaders throughout the kingdom, he said, come to Nicaea, 300 of you. Each of you can bring two other ministers and three lay people. So five, there's estimates as many as 1,800 people came to the council of Nicaea and they went through this whole thing. But the 300 pastors, if you will, that were gathered for this council that came up with this are now going, oh, the emperor wants to see us. Oh yeah, we're legal now. We got tax exempt status. They're not killing us anymore. And they began to get a little drunk on their own import. 325, right? So what happens is now you've got these religious leaders who were fearing for their death, fearing for life, they were gonna be martyrs, who now all of a sudden have been dubbed super important by the emperor, and they go, yeah, I guess we are super important. Let's have some long flowing robes and some big hats to make us really look important. Are you, are you, are you picking up what I'm throwing down? And where did this happen? In the New Rome, in the Nova Roma. Okay? I don't have to connect all the dots for you, but I think you're, you're catching on. So Constantine goes on to build all kinds of churches. You know, if you've ever been to Israel, and if you go there in the future, and I hope that you go with me sometime, you go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Church of the Crucifixion. Who built that? Guess, Constantine. Only a remnant remains of it today because in the year 1009, the Fatimid Caliph Ha-Hakim by Allah, known as the Mad Caliph or the Nero of Islam, decided to burn Constantine's church. Because remember, Islam was invented as a false religion in 600. It was 600 years after Christ, the false prophet Muhammad invented this thing. So now you got the crazy caliph, whatever his name is, we'll just call him the, the Nero of Islam. In the year 1000, what does he do? Hey, listen, you wanna say the Crusades 
are a black mark on Christendom, you can do that, and I will agree to you up to a certain point. But my dad always told me, when somebody starts a fight, you finish it. So the Muslims sweep into Jerusalem and start burning stuff. What do we do to you? <laughs> this was the beginning of the Crusades, ladies and gentlemen. That's what started it all. I'm so far afield in history right now. We got to come back to the year 300 here for a moment. For a moment. But you understand what, Chris, what, 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 what uh, Emperor Constantine did for us. It was awesome what he did for us. But it also... There was a little bit of a downside to what he did. He legitimized Christianity. He made it easy to be a Christian. In fact, oh, Constantine's a Christian? Oh, I want to be a Christian. He's not really a Christian. Remember the, remember the Apostles' Creed? He went with the, I believe, I believe, I believe. So now you got a bunch of political saying, oh, it's, it's, uh, it's so um, chic to be a Christian now because the emperor's a Christian now. And now this idea of what it is to be a Christian gets all watered down and wishy-washy. I'm going somewhere. Hang on. This is all by introduction, by the way. So these, these Roman slash Christian leaders now have gotten themselves all drunk on political power. And it just, it just it's a vortex of, of awfulness. Until along comes a monk by the name of Martin who said, gosh, this just is not right. We're biblicals, aren't we? He didn't quite say it like that, but if I was there, I'd have whispered in his ear. Martin, say biblicals. <laughs> but that's what he was saying. What's all this other stuff? What's, wh what? Why are we doing and why are we paying and why are we praying and, and all these questions, why has, why has this my wife and I use an analogy sometimes when something turns bad. It's like, you know, you, you get a piece of steak, you think it's gonna be a good piece of steak, and you bite down on the steak, and then it like blows up like two times bigger in your mouth because there's something funky little gristly thing inside of there. You don't know what to do with it, you know? And you, you keep chewing, you go, and you reach that point, do I swallow this thing whole, or do I do the <clears throat> napkin thing like that, you know, you know? So it's that bad piece of steak. Christianity had turned into a bad piece of steak, let me just tell you. And Martin said, we gotta be biblicals again. There's a, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be thrown out here. And so he comes up with what we call um, the five solas. The five solas. Let's review. Soli Deo Gloria, means to the glory of God alone. In Isaiah 43, seven, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory. Everything you do and everything that's created is for his glory. Number five, we're working backwards. Number four, sola gratia, Latin, of course. Grace alone, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you are saved through what? Faith, not from yourselves, it's a gift from God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Number three, Sola Christo, Christ alone. Jesus says, I am the way, there's the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. Look up here. Can you imagine the tragedy if the period was here? Nobody gets to go to the Father. Except through me. That's sola Christo. Sola, number two, sola fide. God's the only object of our faith, faith alone. Hey, listen, baptism is great. Church attendance, great. Good works, great. Sincerity, great. But it's faith alone that we're justified. Therefore, Romans 5, 1, since we have been justified through fide, through faith. But the number one, the first and foremost, most foundational principle for us biblicals is sola scriptura. This is my Bible. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of God. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'll never be the same because of this book. It's like, uh, I don't know, when you cook in the kitchen, 
it's, it's not a, well, I guess it would be a, called a colander or a strainer. You pour something in this side that you're trying to get other stuff out of because you want the clean stuff, the pure stuff to come out this side. How about you look at your Bible as a strainer? Yeah. Watch your TV, watch your news, whatever. Talk to your friends. You can get their input, but it has to be strained through this. Sola Scriptura. This is what makes us biblicals. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed, youthful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So what does it mean? Now, now, that was all by way of introduction. Here's my sermon. What does it mean that we're biblicals? I'm gonna give you three things that it means that we're biblicals. First and foremost, it means we live by sola scriptura. Sola Scriptura. All right, let me have my picture of Winston Churchill up here, please. Don't you love this guy? Golly gee, I love this guy. I need to pinch his little fat little cheeks. I love him so much. <laughs> Look at him on that. Look at that. Look at that. He's not in some office somewhere, right? I don't know if you're familiar with, he's a prolific writer. And one of the most interesting things he wrote after the war was a history of the Second World War. Um, and this is a six-volume set of the history of World War II, uh, and there, it's written by um, Winston Churchill. Um, Triumph and Tragedy, Closing the Ring, The Hinge of Fate, The Grand Alliance, The Finest Hour, so I'm reading these backwards, because the very first book that he wrote in this uh, series is called The Gathering Storm. In that book, he talks about the futility of appeasement and the need to stand against dictatorships. That was the whole book. I don't know if you know who the prime minister was before him, Last name is Neville, and he was just a wishy-washy. He is he, uh, Neville Chamberlain. Thank you. That was the book. And as I think about that, I think about our society, and I got myself, as my brother-in-law would say, I hope he's watching today. I got my panties in a wad last week. <laughs> I got a bee in my bonnet last week. I was just irritated, and. Uh, I made a list of some of the things that irritated me. And uh, I had to stop. The list is not complete, I just had to stop. <laughs> Transgender boys allowed in the locker rooms. Two-tier justice system. The New York of, uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo signs a law that legalizes abortions up to birth and then revokes medical care for babies who are born alive after botched abortions and left to die on the table. Biological men being allowed to compete against women. A government just printing out of thin air $1.9 trillion. Parents letting their children decide what gender you should be. No more gingerbread man, now it's gingerbread person. Dr. Six, Dr. Seuss, six books pulled from Amazon's. Six books of Dr. Seuss pulled from Amazon, yet you can still buy Hitler's Mein Kampf or the Satanic Bible. But they take six of Dr. Seuss's books down. Oregon decriminalizing. The possession of oxycodone, heroin, heroin, crystal meth, cocaine, and LSD. Not a problem if you live in Oregon. Yeah, sure. One of the nation's largest evangelical adoption agencies now saying, ah, we'll put kids in LGTBQ homes. Why? Because we'll lose our funding because we attached ourselves to the nipple of the government and got fat. And then they said, 
gotcha. If you don't do what we say, you're not gonna get fed that money anymore. So they capitulated. I'm hoping you're making a connection with me. A woman, a born woman who now identifies as a man has a baby. So she's hailed as a pregnant transgender man. What? I don't even know what I said. (laughs) Taking the phrase under God out of the Pledge of Allegiance. Politicians who remove 10 toilets from their mansion so they don't have to pay taxes. Governments who kill their people. Just Google the word Myanmar just this past week. The reason you're not hearing about it in your news cycle is because there's nothing, there's no oil in that country. There's nothing valuable in that country other than human life. Now the government's just shooting and killing and murdering people in the streets. Order shoot to kill. I'm irritated at governments that lie. Google all governments. (laughs) One out of six children in America live below the poverty level. I hate it that the CDC is using us as guinea pigs. I don't like that there's a half a million homeless people in America today, and I'm really upset that one in three are veterans. When police abuse their power, when the divorce rates are sky high, almost a 50% chance on your first marriage you're gonna get divorced. Well, I'll try it again. 60% chance for second marriages, and if you dare try to get married a third time, your percentage of divorce is 73%. That irritates me. Adults not getting married, just shacking up. I said shacking up. In the age group of 18 to 24, cohabitation is now more prevalent than living with your spouse. I really get irritated at people who want me to dislike someone because of how much money they make or the color of their skin. It really gets me because it's to their advantage that they whip that up in me. Churches and pastors that genuflect and grovel at the feet of political correctness. An inept child welfare system that is broken and costs lives. Disney Plus, deleting classic movies like Dumbo, The Aristocrats, uh, uh, Peter Pan. Peter Pan's racist now. It's 1939 all over again, ladies and gentlemen. It's 1939 all over again. Neville Chamberlain was the appeaser. Oh, we don't want to get in a war. We We just, you know, we should enter into peace talks. You know, as long as we're okay, we're all right. Let all that other stuff happen there. But then Hitler just kept coming, kept coming west. Next thing you know, boom, Belgium, boom, the Netherlands, boom, France, Paris, bam, coming towards the English Channel. And he still wanted to capitulate, still wanted to give in. Then along comes... On May 10th, 1940, this man. Ooh, I like that guy. If we do not learn from history, we are destined to repeat it. He said that. He said, enough of this. We're done playing games. We will not appease. This is the the title of the gathering storm. We will not be appeasers and we will stand up to dictators. So what did he do? He tried his best to rally people with them, allies. The French were a little help. You know anything about the whole World War II? And they folded like a, they folded like a deck of cards. Belgium, Belgium, actually, I'm remembering, Belgium was non-committal. They did not even come down on either side until after Hitler invaded them. And then the Netherlands, okay. I told Aaron to wave at me if I got bogged down in history this morning. I think he's about ready to wave at me. So, so, but are you okay with this story? 
because I'm going to make an application here in just a minute. But you have to have, you've got to know this. So he rallied a bunch of people together who were like, okay, let's do this. What was the rallying cry that Winston Churchill had that got us all together and brought the Americans even into it? It's this. The reason we joined forces with nations against the Nazis is because we all held a common truth of liberty. Freedom. We all held a common truth of liberty coupled with connected to the intestinal fortitude to die for that truth. Because you can have all the intellectual assent to the idea that yes, we should be free and we should be free. But if you don't have, if you're not willing to put your money where your mouth is to step up and to toe the line, put your toe on the line and say, this is what I believe and this is the line that's drawn, then you are no better than Belgium or Neville Chamberlain who capitulates because you're a NIMBY, not in my backyard. As long as me and mine, we're good. And yes, culture is eroding at the edges and is seeping in because your kids go to school or you see this on television and this happens in the government or whatever. It just encroaches, but you just keep making tighter and there's no liberty, there's no freedom. You've capitulated. I'm here to tell you there is a gathering storm. There's a gathering storm and it's marching your way. And if you want... If you want the Panzer Division, you want the tanks of Germany to roll right through your life and demolish you, that's on you. I will stand as a voice that says there's a gathering storm. And you must not only ascend to the idea that liberty is something valuable and something that cohesively gathers us together, but we must be willing to toe the line, to step up and say, enough, you are not coming any further. You're not crossing the English channel of my life. Makes you, think I'm run, makes you think I'm running for office. I'm not. Take a deep breath. It's okay. <laughs> there is a gathering storm in our nation. So what is the common truth that binds us together? This, ladies and gentlemen... I'm not talking about, I'm talking about being a biblical. I'm talking about being something that's not co-opted by the man, that, that we, are, we are played to as some element of society every four years so they can get the evangelical vote, whatever that means. I don't even know what that means. We will be, I am what I am. I'm here. I, here is where I stand. I can, I can say no other. This is us, biblicals not popular, that the Bible is what binds us together. Sola, scriptura. Oh, yes, yes, we all believe to the Bible. Yes, the Bible, yes, the Bible, yes, the Bible. That is having intellectual assent to the idea that we should all embrace liberty as nations uh, in 1940. But unless you have the intestinal fortitude, and I could use a myriad of other things there to tell you how how my language fails me. If I could speak in tongues and you'd all get it, I would do it right now. But understand, just to say, oh yes, the Bible, the Bible is true, is not enough. You must have the intestinal fortitude that says enough. I will pay the price for my freedom. Anything less will be an unconditional surrender because Hitler, of the, the devil doesn't care what you believe until you walk out your beliefs. You believe anything you want. He doesn't care all day long. Anything less will be an unconditional surrender to the hordes of hell who are tearing at the very fabric of your family, even the state and the nation. Polit let me just say, 
I don't care who the politician is, they're not gonna fix this. Politicians can't fix what's wrong with America. We do not need a political movement, we need a theological protest. The Bible must return to a place of prominence in your life and your home, and it must be the final authority to how you run your life and your home. Anything less than that, you're not a biblical. Oh, excuse me, you're not a Christian. Now, I just offended a whole bunch of people who think they're Christians, but they're not. They've sucked up to Emperor Christentine, uh, uh, Constantine thinking they are when they're not. One of the biggest dangers we have in America today is a bunch of people who think they're Christians and they're not. The Bible has to come back to preeminence in your life. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, even judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Jesus is the salt of the earth. Jesus is the light of the world, yes, but then he turned and he said the same thing to us. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light. I've had some recent conversations with people that say things like this. The church should open a Christian foster care home. The church should start a feeding program for the hungry. These are, these are the things I get assaulted with regularly. The church should start a halfway house for people to get out of jail. The church should do something about the abortion of babies. The church should start an after school program for underprivileged kids. The church should take care of orphans and widows. The church should be, uh, should open homes for the unwed mothers. Uh, let me just be clear. Let me just be clear. That's not our responsibility. When you think about the church, the institution of the church, the church should open Christian foster care homes. Yeah, the Lees have done that. The Cooks have done that. Church should start a feeding program. Kevin and Stacy Carter go out to the streets and feed them. The church should start a halfway house for people out of jail. Ryan's working overtime, you don't know this, but Ryan works overtime with one particular inmate trying to get him out of jail, trying to get him into a halfway house. The church should do something about the abortion of babies. You got Daryl and his, his gang that stand out in front of Planned Parenthood every what, Thursday morning, right? You got uh, uh, um, Lee and Don Binky who fight for the unborn. The church should start an after school program. Ann Libri, Ann Libri runs the Matthew Project. The church should take care of orphans and widows. I believe that. Jamie Barros is a missionary. Ivan Tate takes care of it. The church should open homes for unwed mothers. We got Doug and Kim Fields. We got Bonnie Crow that do those things. When you say the church should do that, put your name in the line where you're saying church. So easy to think everybody else should do something. Well, guess what? You're the church. And I'm not talking, I'm singing to the choir, obviously. But I'm talking to some of y'all watching by television who think you're a Christian. You're not a biblical, you think you're a Christian. And the church has fallen down. The church, listen, every, every social ill in this country is our responsibility to fix. It's not the government's responsibility to fix. It's our responsibility to fix. So go fix it. Go feed the hungry. Go open an orphanage. You, you, you're the church. Well, that's just a little, you hurt my feelings, man. I don't care. I don't care. Because I have a responsibility. And this is my responsibility. To tell you, go do it. Oh, 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 oh. You wanna know why? Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Surely I'll be with you always, even to the end of age. So what is the church supposed to do? Preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize believers, and teach them to obey the commands. If we had 300, if we had 200, if we had 12 disciples 
who believed it could turn the world, could be the hinge on which the swing moves, the hinge on which the door opens to the next great revival. I don't know what you, if, you're, if you're a student at all of revival, but none of them were ever started by the government. I'm just telling you, not any of them, not a one. It all started when the church became the church. If I preach the gospel and I make disciples and we baptize believers and we teach them to obey sola scriptura, you will get the fire in your belly to go do those other things, the works. It's not the church's responsibility to do those things. And when you, when you wanna, when people like to say things like, oh, the church, da, 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 da. And then, and then, I, and then I poke back, a little, oh, I wasn't meaning you. Oh, da, da, da. oh, you Neville Chamberlain, you Neville Chamberlain, you. You appeaser, you. Uh-huh. Okay, I got a lot more to say, but that's only point one of a three-point sermon. So y'all just better hang on a minute longer. So number one, if you're a biblical, if you are a biblical, number one, sola scriptura. Number two, we give straight answers. I'm so tired of seeing pastors, so-called church leaders and others who are dodging simple questions. Biblicals do not give non-answers. Biblicals do not give mumbo-jumbo, indirect, mamby-pamby, lukewarm oatmeal answers to direct questions on abortion or gay marriage or is Jesus the only way to salvation? We know the answers and I will not mumbo-jumbo around them. Larry King asks Joel Olstein. What about deeds? We have ministers that come on this show and say, your record doesn't count. You either believe in Christ or you don't. If you believe in Christ, you are, are, uh, are you going to heaven? And if you don't, no matter what you've done, it doesn't matter. Osteen responds, I, I, I listened to it 20 times. I wrote out the transcript myself. This is not a copy and paste, little, ladies and gentlemen. There's a gathering storm and somebody needs to tell you. Osteen responds, yeah, you know, uh, there's probably a balance. King immediately says, but what if you're, a Jew you're Jewish or a Muslim and you don't accept Christ at all? Osteen, yeah, you know, I'm very careful about saying who would and who wouldn't go to heaven. King says, if you believe, you have to believe in Christ, right? They, the Jews and Muslims, they're wrong, aren't they? Osteen, I don't know what I believe, whether they're wrong or right. I think that only God can judge a person's heart. You know, I spent a lot of time in India with my father, Joel Osteen, who's probably rolling over in his grave. And I don't know all about that religion, 33 million gods. Hindu has, Hinduism has 33 million, I don't know a lot about that. I learned that in sixth grade. I wasn't a theologian. I'm not a Bible scholar in sixth grade. I knew that Islam or Hinduism had 33 million gods. But I know they love God. What? And I don't know. I've seen their sincerity. So I just, I guess I don't know. That's Joel Osteen. And I copied it word for word. You can go, you can Google it yourself. You watch the interview. I just picked one of many, one of many. That's a mamby, pamby, wishy-washy Christian leader who should not be followed. Does that mean everything he says is horrible and bad? I didn't say that. I did not say that. But when it comes to this point, biblicals are called to give straight answers, not political correct ones. And, and I'll just tell you this. If you're looking for acceptance and influence with socialites and movers and shakers around you, I mean, the real gospel should come with a warning label, ladies and gentlemen, because there is no, 
There is nada. That there is zero social capital to be gained by joining this congregation. Any congregation that's defined by biblical truth. To the contrary, such affiliation will actually destroy your social capital. Oh, you go there? He's your pastor? He's so weird, so rough, he's so mean. Don't take this as meanness, take this as intensity. I mean, if you're down seven points in the halftime and the coach comes in and says, okay, kids, okay, boys, you're doing such and such a good job. We're all winners here. Everybody's gonna get a trophy. No, 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 no. I pull my kid from that coach. Because I went to the coach and said, listen, you missed a tackle. That's not right. Tighten that up. That's the kind of coach you want. There is what I believe a biblical in office in our let me just say region, who called me just this, was it Friday? It was Friday. This person called me Friday, wanted my advice about the church, wanted my advice on things that, that he's connected to and he's involved. It's on the down low. I won't, use his, I won't use his name. But there are biblicals out there in the system, doing the best they can. But you associate yourself with a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, on-fire, biblical church, there is no social status. If you're here to gain social status, you will quickly leave. Unashamedly pro-life, unashamedly pro-marriage, unashamedly pro-family unashamedly sexual fidelity and purity. Yes. Well, you hate LGBTQ people and, and I don't hate, I love you. Your views are not welcome here, but you are. Yes. Your view, oh, I'm an abort, I had an abortion. I like things, I think divorce, abortions are okay. You are welcome, but your views are not welcome because this is a home, a house run by biblical principles. Come all you are weary and heavy laden. Amen. And the Lord says, I'll give you rest. If you're lesbian, gay, LGB, bi, T, trans, T, Q, queer, welcome. There is a freedom to be found in, in Galatians chapter 5, 1, for it is for freedom that Christ set you free. So you don't have to have that yoke of bondage anymore for my yoke is easy. My burden is light, says the Lord. So you are welcome, but you will not infiltrate your ideas here. You're not welcome. Those ideas are not welcome. You are welcome. You are welcome. Let me say it again. You are welcome. Well, Pastor Hans is a hater. No, I'm a biblical. Sola Scriptura, what does it mean? We are Sola Scriptura, we give straight answers. And can I, can I just take two more minutes and give you the final third point? Or should I just leave you hanging? No. Number three, what does it mean to be a biblical? It means that when we fail, not if, when we fail, what do we do? We repent. We submit ourselves to the discipleship of Christ and with that, believe it or not, comes objective demands on our conduct, on our virtue, on our morality. The commands of Christ are not subjective. One of the problems we have with people that wanna rewrite the Constitution is like, oh, you know, it's just this breathing thing. And a, no, no, it is what it is. Now go even a step further. This is what it is. The entire month of January and February, we talked about the Bible. We talked about the theologies. We said this, these are the truth, the word of God. They're not open for debate. I'm talking about the large rocks, remember? The big things. There's things in here that make us different. You're not like your brother or your sister, biologically speaking. You're from the same family and you part your hair on that side and you part your hair on that side. I don't care what side you part your hair on because I don't have hardly any. <laughs> but what I do care about 
is the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. Do, is that you? And do you not only intellectually ascend to that idea, but will you coalesce with, the, coalesce with those who will be allied against the gathering storm that's coming to get you? Oh, it's a war not fought with tanks. Even the wars today are not fought with tanks. There is another Hitler. There is another regime that wants the downfall of this country so that they can rule. It's communist China. And so it's, it's computer. It's false information. It's all that kind of, that's a war, by the way. It's a war waging war up against this country. So we repent when we fall. No, we will stumble, we will fall. But Proverbs 24, 16 says, for though a righteous man falls, I don't know if you ever saw that or not, but you should really underline that and highlight it as I have done in my Bible. Because verse 16 of Proverbs 24 says, for though a righteous man, a righteous man, I'm a righteous man. And guess what? I'm gonna fall. I'm a righteous, I'm righteous. I'm washing the blood. I'm a Bible believer, I'm on fire for Jesus, but there's, I will stumble and fall. A righteous man or woman will stumble and fall seven times. That's the biblical number of completeness. It means completely and utterly, but he rises again. Um, Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days. He comes out of the wilderness. You know what the first word out of his mouth is? In Matthew chapter four, verse 17, look it up. He says, repent. The very first word out of Jesus' mouth after he spends 40 days in the wilderness wasn't, can somebody get me a sandwich? Can I have a glass of water here? Can you help a brother out? No, it says repent. He goes to the synagogue. Remember, Na- remember, uh, remember Nazareth didn't want him, couldn't do the miracles there. Unbelief, boom, goes up to Ca- uh, Capernaum. We covered this uh, a couple weeks ago. Goes up to Capernaum, goes into the synagogue with Peter. First word out of his mouth, boom, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repentance means to physically turn around, change your actions. You were going that way, now go that way. You were doing this, now go do that. That's repentance. But also mentally, it means to think differently, to change, uh uh-oh, your worldview. All right, now watch this. The reason, here's here's, here's, here's an epiphany. That list of things that irritated me last week that I just stopped, although I could have continued to write. I think Facebook limits you at somewhere around 500 characters. I don't know how many characters. <laughs> but but uh, the reason that irritates me, you know why? Is because I'm trying to funnel them through this colander. I'm trying to put them through this sifter and it's clogging my sifter because this is my worldview. This is how I have chosen to interpret the world. I got lots of things to say, I'll just say this. Here's what a worldview does. They gotta answer three questions. Where did we come from and why are we here? Number two, why is there something wrong with the world? And number three, can what is wrong with the world be fixed? So these three questions will determine what worldview you have. So I just selected one, the naturalistic worldview. If you're a naturalist, if you have the naturalistic worldview, number one, what's, what's the answer? Oh, we're a result of a purposeless act of nature. We're just here by mistake. Number two to that, uh, what's wrong with the world? Um, We're what's wrong with the world. We don't respect nature and take care of it enough. Number three, so the world can be saved, but only through our efforts of environmentalism and conserving. That's a naturalistic worldview. That's your worldview. That's what you believe. That's what you fight for. I could go on, but I'll show you the Christian worldview. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Uh, God created us in the image of himself and where he put us here on earth to rule over it. Which, by the way, doesn't mean we abuse it. I think Christians should be some of the greatest environmentalists that there are on the face of the earth. It's the only one we got. We should take care of it. But it doesn't rule me. I'm to rule it. Why Why does there seem to be something terribly wrong with the world? Well, Well, we sinned against God and now there's a curse. Now there's evil, decay, and death. So what can be, what can be done to fix it? Uh, God came to earth in human form as Jesus, sacrificed himself to pay the penalty for our sin and to one day restore all of creation in a perfect state with him. That's what makes you a biblical. That's a biblical worldview. Anything contrary to that 
is something that has seeped through the calendar of the word and dropped into your life that isn't supposed to be there. If you're a biblical. Now I realize some of you, and listen, I could go on, but I'm, I'm, out of, I, I'm totally out of time. I hope, I hope you embrace the baby I birthed today as a beautiful, cute little child that needs nurturing in your spirit. Because if you kick this idea to the curb, the Paris of your life is about to fall. I'm not saying we're at Dunkirk levels yet where there has to be an army, an armada of civilians coming into rest, but that's how revival comes. It doesn't come, it doesn't come from governments. A revival, a revival doesn't start because pastor says, let's have revival, or we're having revival meetings. It starts when you say, I'm gonna be a biblical. I'm gonna live my house like this is the authoritative word of God. And if no one else comes with me, I'll go down fighting. I will, I'm done with appeasing my enemy. I will not appease him any longer. When you smell him, kick him out. When he comes around your house, kick him out. When he starts gnawing at your marriage, kick him out. When he starts bugging your children, to listen, what's going on here? Oh, oh, I see what's going on here. The devil got up in your head. Now your child's demon possessed. But there's an enemy of your soul, young man. Well, that's not popular to speak. Sorry. Sorry, it's not politically correct. Sorry, not sorry. You know. <laughs> I'm so proud of so many of you that you're already doing it. I mean, what Levi does, well, someone should go out and minister to the people on the street. Well, we have someone who has made that his life. If, now, here's the thing. If you don't have the time and energy to, say, help the, the unwed mothers or to do the after-school thing, then then give Ann Libri and the Matthew Project $100 to buy pizza for the kids after school someday. Start supporting Levi, uh, 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 Levi Vincent Ministries. I wanted to say something else for a second. Levi Vincent Ministries dot, or just give him $1,000 today, write him a check for $1,000. His job is to minister to people on the streets. He doesn't get a paycheck, ladies and gentlemen. He's not an employee. Right? and every other ministry that I've mentioned, and many that I have not mentioned. So don't ever come to me and say, the church should, because I'll take that little bony finger of yours and I'll turn it right back around, <laughs> and I'll point it right at you. Well, maybe you can't off open a, a foster home. Well, then help the cooks, or help the Lees. Yeah, we can collect paper for the Matthews Project. We can do things, but that should not appease, that should not, that should not, satiate the appetite in you to change the world because, you know, you gave a roll of toilet paper. No. Be a biblical. Stand for the truth. Okay, I'm just beating dead horse now. I think you got it. Did you get it? Good, good. Why don't you stand up with me? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the calling card, what the draw was back in the second century before Constantine made Christianity legal. I don't, I don't know what were Christians. Hey man, come out, to, come out to our synagogue, our underground synagogue. We got the best light show. We got the best smoking lights. And man, our sound system really rocks it. And the kids ministry and the children ministry. No man, come and die. You don't like the way the world is broken, right? Right? Okay, well Jesus can fix all of that inside of you. Because when people get their heart right, then they go change the world. Because if you try to change the world without having the right heart, you're doing it for all the wrong reasons. 